Sorry. Good evening, everybody. We're just allowing folks to kind of get into the room. We've just opened the doors. Thank you for joining us for our COVID-19 vaccine webinar. I'm gonna go ahead and let people kind of pile in here. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself real quickly, but um, I, won't, I won't be staying on. My name is Mindy Buchanan. I'm the Director of Patient Programs with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. So I'll be here, but I'll be in the background. Um, and so I wanted to share with you a couple quick things. The first thing is that we have turned the chat function off uh, during this webinar as the questions were submitted uh, during the registration process. So um, with that, I want to give a thank you to our sponsor, Loringel Inkelheim. And we wanna tell you just a really quick bit about our summit coming up. Our patient education summit is virtual June 12th to the 13th. Really exciting. We've got six plenary sessions, including answering your medical questions, research and sarcoidosis, um, FSR overview, and finding knowledgeable providers. Uh, we also have a providers as patients panel. So that'll be a really cool one so that our patients who are kind of on both sides of those coins. And we have an FSR speakers bureau showcase uh, with 15 patient stories. Additionally, we have tracks focusing on different manifestations, including uh, Sarcoidosis 101 for those folks who are new to having sarcoidosis or are suspected to have sarcoidosis, chronic sarcoidosis for those folks who've had it for a while, and an overview uh, session as well that kind of is the middle ground. Additionally, we have 15 exhibitors where you can find information and videos and chat with representatives from all of our exhibitor booths. And we have tons of networking opportunities, including 12 chat rooms, an open coffee break Zoom, you can pop in anytime, all day long, one-on-one -on -one messaging and video chats with individuals that are at the summit and connecting via shared interests. So if you said you liked something on your registration, you're bound to bounce into someone else who said they liked it too. Finally, uh, we will be giving early access to the platform. So if you register, you get up to four days to poke around and see how things work. And the content will all remain available until August 13th. Uh, the early bird price ends tomorrow, guys. So if you're interested in registering, I, I encourage you to go to stopsarcoidosis.org and get yourself registered. And we also have scholarships that we award every Friday. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to introduce John Carlin. He is an award. He's our moderator today, so you won't have to see me. Uh, he's an award-winning news anchor currently working at WSLS 10 in Roanoke, Virginia. He's uh, the host of the bi-weekly Thark Fighter podcast, which you guys might have heard. You can also find it on our website. And he's an FSR patient advocate and member of FSR's patient advisory committee. John is also an avid cyclist and a strong pillar of his local community, loving a loving husband, father, and grandfather, and sarcoidosis warrior. So with that, it's off to you, John. All right, Mindy, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. And uh, we have some great, great questions for uh, the two doctors who have agreed to join us and sort of kind of sort out all of the, the issues that we all have when it comes to sarcoidosis and COVID and vaccines. And I just know there are a ton of questions about that. So let me introduce our two panelists tonight. And I will start with Dr. Wonder Per Year Drake. Uh, she works at the, Dr. Drake, thank you. Uh, she works at the Sarcoidosis Center of Excellence, Department of Medicine at the Division of Infectious Diseases at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Drake has published over 40 articles in sarcoidosis, pulmonary fibrosis, and the etiology, as well as pathogenesis of chronic inflammatory conditions. Dr. Drake is a recipient of FSR's small grant for her project entitled what is the clinical impact of IL-6 blockade on sarcoidosis pulmonary fibrosis? This investigation examined the increased production of IL-6 in certain T cells in female sarcoidosis patients compared to males. The proposal also looks at the therapeutic efficacy of IL-6 blockade on sarcoidosis pulmonary fibrosis. Dr. Drake has received funding from NIH and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and is the recipient of multiple American Thoracic Society awards for excellence in sarcoidosis research. So Dr. Drake, thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. And also joining us tonight is Dr. Peter Sporn. 
Dr. Sporn is a professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He is the director of the Multidisciplinary Sarcoidosis Program at Northwestern Medicine, a designated sarcoidosis center of excellence. He sees patients at both Northwestern Memorial Hospital and also at the Jesse Brown Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Chicago. And I've been asked to know that beyond medicine, he is a lover of jazz music. Dr. Sporn, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. All right, so doctors, uh, we've, uh, we have received a lot of questions and we have a, a huge audience tonight. And I think that's indicative of, uh, of the interest in, in this subject material. And I know you both have had a chance to look at the questions and we saw a lot of them repeated over and over in one form or another. And, and so tonight we've sort of distilled this down to uh, the, the very uh, essence of what we were hearing over and over. And in an hour, we'll get through as many of them as we can. So I wanna throw the first question out about the different types of COVID-19 vaccines. Who wants to field this one first? Had you two decided ahead of time who will be handling this one? Um, I'm, I'm happy to. We, we, okay. we said we'd just kind of go back and forth. Okay, and that's great. <laughs> and I may jump in at any given time. Um, that's kind of what I'm used to doing because of my job in television news. And, um, uh, yeah. and, and so if I feel like you skipped right over something or maybe uh, we could have, we, we were talking above the heads of the audience, I may ask you to clarify if that's okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. we'd, yeah that's our goal. So okay, great. You. Sure. So um, Dr. Drake, the first question is number one, how many different types of COVID-19 vac COVID vaccines are there? How do they differ? Which ones are available in the United States? Which are available elsewhere in the world? Uh, and where might we see those sort of co-mingle uh, the rest of the world here or vice versa? If you want to take a stab at that. Yeah, so th that's an excellent question and a great question to start with. There are dozens and dozens of vaccines actually. Uh, in different phases of development, but there are primarily three right now in the United States that I think it would be beneficial for the audience to be aware of. There's one with Pfizer, one with Moderna, and then just recently reenacted one with Johnson & Johnson. And um, most of the vaccines, two of them are mRNA vaccines. Um, one of the things that I think patients should be aware of is the differences in efficacy. So um, I just want to be clear, the Johnson & Johnson, I think, is the one that's the one, one shot. That's the one shot vaccine. Yep. Well, let me make sure I'm telling you right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's the one shot. And then the Moderna and Pfizer are the two shots. And um, the efficacy varies a bit. So with the two shot vaccines, if you get both shots and you're two weeks beyond your second shot, then you should, with the Pfizer and the Moderna, have in the protection somewhere in the high 80s, low 90s. So some, I say somewhere around 90% efficacy for preventing infection. Johnson & Johnson with the single shot is, it, different studies show different things. On average, it's around 75%. So the study in Israel showed, and then the study in the United States showed, um, depending on how old the patient is, it can be as low as one. On, if you look at the data with the two shots, because uh, it's kind of funny when you look at the number of people that have gotten any vaccination in the United States, it's 50%. But the majority of people are getting one shot and then high-fiving each other. So, so really the efficacy for um, the Pfizer and the Moderna is somewhere around the high 70s, low 80s with the first shot. And then it bumps to 90% when you get your second shot. So I want the audience to be aware that the efficacy that we're citing is dependent upon patients getting two shots, Moderna or Pfizer. And then the Johnson & Johnson, it's a little bit tough because they get, they didn't get, they haven't as many people come through with Johnson Johnson because they kind of got blocked at the FDA briefly. So, but it is somewhere at least in the high 80s from the Israeli study. All right, very good. And then um, uh, I wanted to have you guys jump in. Maybe Dr. Sporn, you could handle this. Um, this is the United States. How about in Europe or India or Japan where we're hearing all these terrible stories about how they're trying to cancel the Olympics because nobody has a shot, but different parts of the world, there are different vaccines available. Um, do we know the efficacy of those? Will the US vaccines travel there or vice versa? 
Well, actually, the the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and the Johnson, <clears throat> excuse me, and Johnson vaccine uh, are all available in other countries now. Um, Different uh, countries have different regulatory bodies that determine which vaccines get approved. So I can't tell you precisely which countries uh, off the top of my head have approved which vaccines, but I think it's fair to say that the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine have been approved widely across the world in many, many countries and are available uh, to, to varying degrees based on supply. Uh, throughout the world. The same uh, is true, maybe to a somewhat lesser extent for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So those are the vaccines that are approved here that are also available in other parts of the world. There are many other vaccines, as Dr. Drake said, that are in various phases of development, but some of the other vaccines have been approved in other parts of the world, not currently in the United States. There are other vaccines that will probably um, at some point in the future, perhaps even in the near future for at least one vaccine be approved in the United States. But uh, as people have probably heard, for example, there is a Russian vaccine called Sputnik or Sputnik V. That's available in many parts of the world. There are two vaccines that were developed in China. Uh, one is called Coronavac and the other one is called um, uh, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but there is a second Chinese vaccine. And those vaccines have been distributed widely in many countries. There are also other vaccines that are available in a few places, um, but um, those uh, vaccines probably aren't going to be available in the United States in the near future. People have probably heard about this vaccine from a company in, uh, in the UK called Astra AstraZeneca. It was developed in conjunction with uh, uh, scientists at Oxford University, which is in England. And that vaccine is available in Europe and it's been widely used there and in other countries. And um, we don't have that in the United States at the present time, but that may become available in the US at some point in the future as well. All of these vaccines are effective to varying degrees. And you know, just to uh, second, what Dr. Drake said about the efficacy of the vaccines that we do have in the United States, all three of those vaccines are highly effective. They haven't actually been compared to one another in head-to-head -head studies. Mm -hmm. So the numbers we have about efficacy, you know, we've heard numbers like 90 to 95% for Pfizer and for Moderna and a slightly no, lower number for, for Johnson & Johnson. But that's not actually based on a head-to-head -head comparison. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine was tested in some other parts of the world uh, and they came up with slightly lower efficacy numbers, but as we probably will get into, there are some different versions of the virus circulating and they have changed with time, what people call variants. So I'm sure we're gonna talk about that. But um, so with the slightly no, lower number of, for efficacy of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it may be because many of the people who were in the trials where the Johnson & Johnson vaccine were tested had some of these newer variants, which may be a little bit more difficult to protect against. Fortunately, the vaccines uh, are, appear to be effective against all the variants that are circulating in the United States right now. Yeah, and Peter's right. Um, in um, South Africa, he's referring to, they used the Johnson & Johnson and they have um, the South African strain, I forget the number, but it basically only shows 63% efficacy in one study and no efficacy in another. So the South African government pulled the Johnson & Johnson vaccine there. And it's totally because they had a different strain causing um, coronavirus infection than the ones that we have here in the United States. So if, if the strains cross over, we may see changes in um, vaccine, in vaccine efficacy. And that's why Fauci and other leaders are discussing, will we need a booster? Right, yep, that was, uh, that was in the news today, as a matter of fact. Um, I wanna go on to the next question. And, and this dovetails, I think, pretty obviously from what we've been talking about. And the question is, how is it possible to develop vaccines against COVID-19 in the less than the year? Because uh, here in the sarcoidosis space, we're always hearing about people trying to find 
a drug in the years and years and years of clinical trials, something that'll work against sarcoidosis. And yet, boom, here in less than a year, we've got the vaccine to fight COVID. So A, how do they do that? And B, is it safe? Who wants to handle that first? <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> so that's an excellent question. So I think there are a couple of things. There were, so unlike sarcoidosis, SARS-CoV-2, we knew the cause of the disease. And when you know the cause of the disease, it's much easier to move faster. Second of all, there had been researchers at the NIH, Barney Graham, for example, and at Vanderbilt, Mark Dennison, who had been studying cousins of SARS-CoV-2 for the last two decades. So if, when SARS presented itself, they knew the virus structure. They knew antibodies that would most likely work against it. And at Vanderbilt, we have a vaccine immunologist named James Crow. He was featured on 60 Minutes, where he basically has a factory where they do nothing but make vaccines. And he actually discussed there how they had gotten new technology in that enabled them using computer technology. And then through this mechanism, they have to grow the virus really fast to try all these different antibodies. So when it broke out in China, they immediately got sera from people who died and sera from people who were around people who died but didn't get sick. They were able to pull out the antibodies from the people who didn't get sick, make multiple copies of that antibody and then infect the virus, infect animals with the virus through collaborations and show that that antibody worked. And once they saw that, that antibody worked, then they just started making a ton of it and sold the license to the pharmaceutical companies who do nothing but make antibodies. Does that make sense a little bit? So it really was, we knew what the cause was. People had been working on cousins of SARS-CoV-2 through called MERS, because it, it infects bats and they're wondering why bats were dying. So they, they knew a lot about SARS before it got to the United States at the end of February, beginning of March last year. And then because they basically had a factory already in place because they were making um, vaccines against influenza, they were making vaccines against uh, chikamunga virus, they were making it against dengue. They just basically stopped all of that and concentrated on nothing. So it really shows what man can do when everybody works together, focuses, and then just kind of, this is what we're gonna focus on. The NIH pumped a ton of money into it. So it, it was, um, I just think it was a blessing that so many things went in the right place that somebody already kind of knew the structure of this virus. So that wasn't difficult. Somebody had already been working on with this cousin so they knew how to grow it rapidly. I mean, it was just a blessing that so many of the right people were in the right place. And then the second question is, is it safe if something comes, um, <laughs> appears that fast? And I think, you know, I want to, I don't want to ever discourage people about vaccine hesitancy. I think sometimes we make people feel like they're an ogre or an idiot because they're, they have genuine concerns. I, I actually don't think that's wrong at all. I think we're all here on the planet for a reason to help each other grow. And so I don't think it's wrong to question how do we know it's safe? And the question is we've done as the type of clinical, so for SARS-CoV-2, because so many people were dying, we have not done as rigorous of studies as we would have done for example, as we did with HIV, like Dr. Sporn mentioned, where you take the different drugs and test them head to head and ask which one is better. We haven't done that because so many people were dying from this disease. We, we basically, I don't want to say we accelerated how quickly they were approved. And now we're finding out. Now, what is encouraging is 50% of the people in the United States have gotten at least one shot of this drug. And people are not dying when they get these shots. You know, they're not coming in, into the hospital in large numbers. We see 0.01% coming into the hospital after they've gotten the vaccine. So I, I think that encourages me. I'm continuing to monitor and watch. You know, the Netherlands did have an outbreak of 35 deaths after mm -hmm. they gave um, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine to some nurse, skilled nursing, nursing home residents. 35 people died like within two weeks. And so they, they stopped dispensing the drug, um, the, the vaccine. So definitely it's not wrong to question. You just don't want to be extreme on either end. You don't want to be naive and say nothing can ever happen with these vaccines because we have accelerated their product, their emergence and given them to people in a way that we didn't do for HIV, in a way we didn't do for flu drugs, in a way we didn't do for other medicines. But at the same time, you don't want to say they don't work at all 
because they clearly are making a difference. In sure, sure. And what's what's the greater evil, the um, the potential downside from the drug or the potential downside from the virus, right? Dr. Right. Swan, would you agree <laughs> with that? I agree 110 uh, percent. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the United States now, we've had almost 600,000 people. Think about that. 600,000 people, uh, well over half a million people die of this uh, virus, the infection that is caused by this virus in just over a year. Um, it's, it's possible that a small number of people have died as a result of getting the vaccine, but um, now that um, more than 170 million people have received, or perhaps the number is even higher than that today, but that's the number I heard a few days ago, have received at least one dose of one of the vaccines just in the United States. Um, and um, we've reduced the number of infections and the number of deaths um, coincident with, so you know, in the same time frame that the vaccine has been rolled out, the number of deaths, which were at a very, very high level in the wintertime before the vaccine was uh, widely distributed, now has been cut to a fraction of that. So I really think it's fair to say that hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved uh, by the vaccine. Um, and just to add to what Dr. Drake said about the development of the vaccine, you know, she emphasized the fact that it was possible to determine the cause of this infection and identify the virus and its structure, its genetic uh, material very, very rapidly because of advances in technology for, for studying viruses. But the other thing that people should understand is that the methods for developing a vaccine, are like the different types of vaccines that um, have now been developed, the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, which are both mRNA vaccines, and the um, uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which use uh, another type of virus to get the, 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 the vaccine into cells, and that's called an adenoviral vector. We can talk more about that in a minute. But the technology and the methods for developing these vaccines, people have been working on for more than a decade. And so it was almost like being in the right place at the right time that this virus came along because they were poised with the technology that had been developed over the decade or more of research on this to actually just plug the structure of the virus into uh, the system that had been developed and then create a vaccine. And then the other thing is that, you know, when you study the effectiveness of a treatment in, a, in, in people, whether it's a drug for a disease or whether it's a vaccine for an infection, how quickly you can get the information you need to prove whether it's effective or not and whether it's safe depends on how common the illness is. And one thing about COVID was that it was happening in millions and millions of people. So it was possible to do a study where they could, they, they could get, in the case of the Pfizer vaccine as just one example, because that was the first one that was approved, 44,000 people recruited into a study within a matter of just a couple of months. And that was a tiny fraction of all the people who were getting sick. But it was possible to do that study so quickly uh, because of how common the illness was and how quickly it progressed. So it was possible to determine whether or not we could prevent this infection or prevent uh, serious uh, uh, type of illness from the infection really, really quickly. And so going back to uh, the safety question, I just want to say hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved by the vaccine. We can't say that no one ever got sick from the vaccine, that no one ever died from it. But it's, you know, the balance of uh, the equation is so much in favor of getting vaccinated. Your chance of dying of COVID is so much greater than your chance of dying of the vaccine that you should get the vaccine, in my opinion. I, well, and we, you know, we're hearing a lot of that from the various health departments, nationally, locally, statewide. Um, uh, we're, we're hearing that message over and over. Um, but, and this is anecdotal information, but one of my observations where I work is the young people seem to, when they get the, um, the second dose of the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, 
they the, a lot of them are missing a day of work because they're having that mm-hmm. fever they're having sort yeah. of uh, an adverse reaction which then goes away but they are having that side effect and that i mean that's that's obviously way better than getting covid is that pretty much what you're seeing and is there a difference between young people and old people when it when it comes to that um Oh, Younger, Peter, did you want to answer? Older, like, I'm, you know, I'm middle-aged and I had no reaction, for instance, but all the people that I work with in their 20s, they're missing a day of work. Yeah, you know, it definitely seems to parallel the strength of your immune response to this booster. Um, remember we said that it's this 90% efficacy is when you get the second dose. Now I am seeing these uh, reactions. It's kind of varied. So there are people who are our age in their 50s and 60s who when they get the second dose it puts them down for a day or two and and they're having fever and arm pain and a couple of them have rash so I I think people are but you're right it's really a sign more than anything that your immune system really is being boosted with this second dose and you're feeling flu-like symptoms like I had a gentleman in his mid-50s who was off work for four days you know Um, he said I just couldn't get out of bed I felt like I had the flu you know what I mean so, um. Yeah, I would just add that uh, these reactions are not all that uncommon, um, and they are more common in younger people, but um, many people have no adverse reaction at all, um, and uh, for those that do, on average, those symptoms last a day or so, and uh, it's really unusual to have four days of symptoms, but it can occur. But, uh, you know, I see that there are over 100 people, over 120 people actually, on this uh, town hall right now. And I would venture a guess that the majority of people on this call know somebody, perhaps a family member or a friend, who's had COVID and uh, was quite ill. I hope that no one on the call lost a family member or dear friend, but I wouldn't be surprised if that were the case. well, that me, is much, me, much worse than the side effects of this vaccine. I want, I want to jump in because now, every, you know, everybody on this call is, um, is in the sarcoidosis space somewhere. And almost everybody in the sarcoidosis space is, is uh, taking some sort of um, um, immunosuppressant drug to help them deal with their sarcoidosis. And so, so I think the question, the million dollar question that we want to answer before we get out of here, and let's just jump right in on it right now is if you're taking any of these drugs, not the Trexate, Imuran, Prednisone, Azathioprine, Celsep, Remicade, Humira, if you're taking any of those and A, you are exposed to the coronavirus, is it going to be better or worse? Or B, if you get the vaccine, is it going to be better or worse? Who wants to start with that? Uh, I can take a step. All right. So the bottom line is that we don't know all the answers. Um, I mean, that was a multi-part question, but I think that um, we, we don't have any good information to say that having sarcoidosis by itself makes you either more likely to get COVID or that if you get COVID, you're going to have a worse case than if you didn't have sarcoidosis. Now, if you have sarcoidosis and you have badly damaged lungs or a badly, you know, if if it affects your heart and, 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 you know, your heart function is decreased as a result of that, you're probably at greater risk. And so certainly you want to take precautions. Um, As far as whether being on prednisone or methotrexate or Remicade or any of the other drugs that we use to treat sarcoidosis uh, makes it less likely that you're going to respond well to the vaccine. There is really not any definite information about that. We know that people who are on stronger immunosuppressive drug schedules or drug regimens, like people who have had organ transplants, and perhaps someone on the call has had an organ transplant. Those medicines that we use to treat, to to prevent rejection of a transplanted organ, um, they suppress the immune response 
much more strongly than the typical medicines we use to treat sarcoidosis. Organ transplant recipients on average have a lower response to the vaccine than people who aren't immunosuppressed. One of the things we don't know though is, as I said, you know, if you're on prednisone at a modest dose, five or 10 or 15 milligrams of prednisone, if you're on methotrexate at 10 or 15 or 20 milligrams per week, or if you're getting Remicade, which is a different type of drug, of course, um, does that prevent you from responding to the vaccine? And the answer is we don't know, but I think it's very likely that the impact of those uh, treatments is less severe than the impact of the drugs that we use to prevent um, transplant rejection. We use some of the same drugs, but um, some drugs that are used to, to, to prevent rejection actually suppress the immune system more than these drugs. So at, actually at Northwestern, we're about to embark on a study where we're going to look at this question. We're going to look at the antibody levels in people with sarcoidosis who get vaccinated uh, and we're going to analyze what the impact of these various treatments we use for sarcoidosis is on the response to the vaccine. So we're going to learn more about this in the, in, in the coming months. Dr. Drake, you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, um, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Sporn. I think everyone should be aware that even people who are not on immune suppressors, if you're over the age of 65, you don't mount a stronger response after vaccination. That's what the early data suggests as someone who's uh, 65 or younger. So just age in and of itself seems to be a determinant of how well you respond to the vaccine. And then um, I think we just, that's why they're encouraging people to get two shots and not just one. <laughs> so I just we're plug in for that. And then I think also um, just to remember that, you know, there are multiple factors as Dr. Sporn was alluding to, to try to, and I think his study is an excellent one to try to understand. I would not take the premise that because I'm on immune suppressant, there's no point in me getting the vaccine because I won't mount a response. I don't think that's true at all. And actually, I, I got a text yesterday from people asking me questions. Um, you can definitely, your doctor can draw your blood, your everyday doctor can draw your blood and see if you have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. I know when we looked at Red Cross blood donors, it was very interesting that the incidence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection was actually double what we thought because there was a whole population with asymptomatic infection. And the way that we could tell is when we drew, when they looked at the Red Cross database, there were antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, even though the person said they'd never been infected to their knowledge. So I guess that I want people to understand that there definitely are, um, uh, people are mounting immune response to SARS-CoV-2 and a immune response is better than no immune response, is what I think. And then I also uh, want to encourage people to realize that if you get the two shots, you're more likely to have a booster, and that will give you even more antibody that hopefully will be effective. So if somebody if somebody has if somebody has the the, the two shots and they they have no um, perceived um, immune response. In other words, they don't feel sick after the second shot. Does that mean it didn't work? No, no. That's the point I was making with the Red Cross. Okay. <laughs> it's just hilarious that it turned out that there was, um, we thought our incidence in the state of Tennessee was an uh, incidence of SARS-CoV-2 COV2 infection was about 20%, but it turned out to be 38% when you looked at the Red Cross database of donors that came in. And these were young, these are mostly young, healthy people. They were having asymptomatic infection and had strong antibody responses, but never had any symptoms. So you can't equate symptoms with a strong response or lack of symptoms with a weak response. John, could I add something to yes, that? Please. Uh, so I agree with everything Dr. Drake said. And it's also true that um, if you have no reaction, no symptomatic reaction, you don't feel sick after you get the vaccine, it doesn't mean that you're not generating good levels of antibody. In fact, it really isn't correlated very well. People who feel kind of flu-like for a day after the vaccine don't necessarily have higher levels of antibody after getting vaccinated than people who don't feel anything. And I, I wanted to just go back to what I said about people who are on medicines to 
prevent rejection for organ transplants. I, I don't want to leave the audience with the wrong impression that if you're on immunosuppressive medicines, you're not going to, even strong immunosuppressive medicines, you're not going to benefit from the vaccine. Because in a recent study, even people on the strong immunosuppressant drugs that we use to prevent organ transplant rejection, which I said do have a suppressive effect on the response to the vaccine, even in those patients, half of the people who got two doses of, of either the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine did generate good levels of antibody. So um, it's definitely important to get the vaccine. Um, that will provide you with a measure of protection, even if we can't be absolutely certain in everybody with sarcoidosis that it's the same level of protection in people who don't have sarcoid or are on these medicines. We had a question from someone who, who wondered, should they just maybe stop taking their sarcoid medication before they get the vaccine? W would that be beneficial in any way? I, I think I'm hearing both of you say that would not be beneficial. No, I mean, what, what we're encouraging people to do is to work really closely with their primary care doctor. And please don't self-adjust your medications because it could turn out when sarcoid flares, it has a lot of common symptoms with SARS-CoV-2, like you've got fever, shortness of breath, sometimes cough. So it would just really confuse the picture clinically. So really what we, I would encourage people to do is to speak to your primary care doctor or your lung doctor, explain to them that you're interested in taking the um, medicine, taking the, getting the vaccine, and then they can relay to you how it should be done. If they think you should, taper your medicine down safely, then you should do it in conjunction with them. But to do it yourself and potentially lead to your sarcoidosis flaring, is going to be a very confusing picture to the clinician because there is this SARS-CoV-2. Remember, sarcoid flare is a disease, a diagnosis of exclusion, you know, because we've got to rule out all these other things. So it just wouldn't be wise to try to do it by yourself. All right. So, so just stay on your medicine. Don't, don't switch that up. Yeah, or, stay on or, your medicine. Work your with your primary care doctor or your lung doctor. Work with them, okay. you know. And then somebody else said, well, Ken, um, and, you, and you sort of touched on this, and it might be hard to tell, but uh, if you all of a sudden stop taking your sarcoid medicine, but there's no, no evidence to suggest that any of these vaccines can cause a flare in sarcoidosis, is there? Right. Yeah, no, I haven't seen anything, Dr. Sporn. No, I don't think so. Um, you know, the the uh, blah feeling or the mild fever that someone might have for a day could be confused with a flare-up of sarcoidosis, but it's very, very unlikely that that if it if it does occur, if those symptoms do occur after getting the vaccine, that they're going to last more than a day. And I think that it, if if somebody has been vaccinated and feels symptoms like that for a day or so, or perhaps two, and then feels better, it's pretty clear it's not a flare-up of sarcoidosis. Um, so uh, I don't know of any evidence that the vaccines can trigger a flare-up of sarcoidosis. And we don't think that's likely based on uh, evidence from other diseases too, because uh, of course, sarcoidosis isn't the only disease where people are asking questions like this. There are many other inflammatory and immune conditions uh, where um, patients are concerned and doctors and other researchers have been looking at this question. And the evidence that's out there so far does not suggest that the vaccination can uh, trigger flare-ups of various different kinds of inflammatory or immune or autoimmune conditions, sarcoidosis or other. Right. Um, there was a, a number of questions concerning blood clots, and I know that was one of the side effects that very early on, I believe with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, correct me if I'm wrong, was, was a concern by medical science. Is there, is there still any lingering concern about blood clots, or is there a sarcoidosis-related concern to blood clots as a side effect from any of these vaccines? So there, there were some serious blood clots associated with particularly the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, but um, 
those occur on the order of maybe one in a million or one in half a million people getting vaccinated. COVID itself is associated with a pretty significant risk of blood clots. The risk of blood clots associated with COVID is many, many times greater than the risk of blood clots associated with the vaccine. Because like I said, one in half a million to a million people uh, receiving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine were discovered to have these serious blood clots. Um, and it may be related to the vaccine. It's not definite that that's the case, but it's such a rare event and the benefit of the vaccine is really so clear um, that um, I think it's, it's, it's obvious to me at least that uh, when you weigh the pros and the cons, the pros for the vaccine far, far outweigh the cons. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, the publicity was about the J&J &J vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but there were these really rare blood clots associated with some of the other vaccines as well. The ones that are available in the U.S., Pfizer and Moderna, and others that are not available in the U.S. But again, these are really, really rare events. So I don't think that should cause anybody to not get vaccinated because you got to remember, it's not just about the risk of the vaccine. It's about the risk of not getting the vaccine. Okay, very good. Uh, Dr. Drake, you agree with that or should we move on to the next question? Oh uh, yeah, I, I do. I, I agree exactly with what he, what he said. Okay. Um, here is an interesting question. Should people with sarcoidosis- I guess I should have disagreed to keep it exciting. Shouldn't there you go. <laughs> Let's have some we're good friends, so, you know, it's not like, um, yeah, we agree on most things. <laughs> okay, great. Should people with sarcoidosis get an extra dose of one of the vaccines to boost their immune response? I'm not even aware of any place where you can get an extra dose. Uh, if you get Johnson & Johnson, you get one. You get Moderna or Pfizer, you get two. I don't know anybody that's offering three yet, but that's a question, so that's something that's out yeah, there. Yeah, no, what some people are doing, because, uh, you know, in the United States where we've been blessed with such abundance, we have this mentality that more is better. And, you know, more isn't always better. What some people are doing is getting two different vaccines from two different places. So they may go to one provider and get their Pfizer two shots and then to a different provider and get a Moderna, sort of mixing their vaccines, but in order to get uh, even more, because in America, we're taught more is better, which is not isn't necessarily that, isn't true. Isn't that dangerous? Um, I don't know if it's dangerous. I don't think it's smart. You know, I've, one of the things that they're now, the scientific community is transitioning to is really asking how much um, antibody is enough. Like, even though you go from 80 to 90%, does, does that really, you get a significant boost when you get your second, that, do you really need that? Are you protected at 80%, you know, from the majority of, uh, for the strains circulating in the United States right now. So I was just on a call on um, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, where we were in fact discussing that, that we need to do the studies now where we clearly define how much antibody is sufficient to provide protection. Do you actually need the second shot? I think more and now that COVID has quelled down, people are starting to be a lot more rigorous and a lot more um, thoughtful about asking questions that I think they should have asked a while back. Um, and so, you know, definitely there's no data that a third shot is going to give you even more protection. You're going to become a coronavirus. <laughs> you, keep, you know what I mean? So I, I, that's all I was going to say is I don't, I, there definitely are people mixing vaccines uh, in the attempt of trying to get three because in the United States, we think more is better, you know. Okay. Um, I would just add that, you know, in the future, we're going to learn more and, uh, we haven't talked about the variants yet, but I think that's probably something that's on people's minds. And uh, as, this, as this virus mutates and the variants that people keep hearing about essentially are mutant versions of the virus, um, it may change to a degree at some point that we do have to give a booster or a modified version of the virus, that, a modified version of the, of the vaccine that covers these new variants better than the uh, original versions of the virus, but we don't have that information yet. 
But it wouldn't surprise me. I think most of us who are working um, in the field recognize that in the future, we may end up giving additional shots, but we don't have any information to say that that's beneficial now and it's not being offered. So I don't think people should worry about needing to get a third shot, for example, if they got two shots of Pfizer or two shots of Moderna. Six months or a year from now, we may be, um, we, we may know that uh, it's beneficial to have an additional shot, a booster at that point. Certainly we know that, for example, with the flu shot, it's recommended to get a new flu shot every year because the flu virus also mutates or changes. And so every year, um, the experts who develop the vaccine for the flu look at the strains that are circulating and they make new versions of the vaccine to cover the new uh, variants of influenza. And so that may have to be the case for COVID, the COVID virus, coronavirus in the future. We don't know yet, we'll see. And, and piggybacking on that, I, I agree exactly with what Peter said. I think that's where we're headed. I mean, the good news is, there are two, to me, uh, encouraging news. One is the vaccine does work very well with the strains that are circulating within the United States. Looking at other countries, Pfizer and Moderna does provide efficacy against at least two of the four variants, uh, potentially three of the four variants that we're seeing. So there are variants from Brazil, um, UK, Africa, and um, blanket on the last one, Peter. Do you remember? It's four variants. Um, oh, there's a lot of variants, but there's the it, there are variants in Indian. India. Yeah, yes. India. Yeah, yes. of course, India. Yeah. And and so it definitely looks like um, the the Brazil the South African. So the Johnson and Johnson did not work well against the South African variant. But Pfizer and both Moderna did work well against the other three. Uh, we're seeing we're starting to see cases of uh, pop up in the in the United States of the other variants, but they're not nearly what they are in other countries. But I, I think people should be encouraged that you even right now have some protection against the variants if the, those cases start to rise more significantly in the United States. And the vaccine makers are already testing uh, uh, advanced versions of the vaccine, you know, mm -hmm. uh, newer versions of the vaccine that will cover better these uh, emerging variants. So that research is ongoing now, but they're already doing new studies to look at improved uh, versions of the vaccine to cover the variants that are developing emerging. in the world now. Yeah. And so people should feel reassured that that's happening. Um, you know, we're not just sort of, uh, or at least I should say the field uh, of research here isn't stagnant. It's not that people are sitting on their laurels and saying, you know what, we got a bunch of good vaccines, so let's just sit tight. No, um, the science is moving along and the vaccine makers are modifying their virus and testing new versions to see how we can continue to make sure that we have really strong protection against the virus as it changes. You know, it, it feels like we're, we're definitely turning the tide against coronavirus now. The, the, the number of cases is down. The number of vaccinations is up. Uh, they're starting to open things up for concerts and sporting events and so forth and so on. So it feels like the at least the United States is coming out of this right now. Um, will there be enough reason to continue to research sarcoidosis and coronavirus because, uh, you, know, as, you know, two or three years from now, will we even still be talking about COVID? Um, and, and is it worth spending a bunch of money and time and energy looking at uh, how, how sarcoidosis patients react to this? Or should we just move on and just work on just sarcoidosis? What, where do you see that going? Uh, that's an excellent question, John. So we should continue the research for two reasons. One, um, SARS has cousins. And remember that we had emergence of, uh, of SARS. We, we didn't call it SARS, we called it, I'm trying to remember, we had emergent, every 10 years, a, a variant of these coronaviruses appears in human population. So we will see this virus again. Uh, this particular SARS-CoV-2, the reason it got so much attention is it resulted in so much death. 
worldwide death, unlike the others where there was an outbreak in Asia, you know, or, you know, or an outbreak in bats. We found a bunch of dead bats. So, so you know, I, I do think we should, we should appreciate um, that this virus is cyclical. Its emergence in the human population is cyclical. And the reason we were able to respond so quickly was because people, it's so funny when you talk to the person at the NIH who actually uh, characterized the spike protein. He, as Peter said, he had been working in this area, publishing in this area for over a decade. And he said, you know, I don't know if this will ever result in anything. He, I, he told the story about two weeks ago, um, just saying that he was publishing in high impact papers and, but this wasn't, people weren't really like, the drug companies weren't really interested in it. And it wasn't until SARS emerged and he said, oh, let me show you what I know about spike proteins with these viruses. And he showed them this data and this paper and then stuff he hadn't published. And they said, this is what we should use for the vaccine. But if he had not continued during this doldrum of people having interest in it, he was interested in it because he was interested in it scientifically. But when he was able to explain to them how you could actually, the adenovirus work he had been doing with other viruses, and he was able to pivot very quickly to coronavirus and show them how they could use the spike protein with the adenovirus to make a very quick vaccine. You said spike protein. So that picture we see the little ball with all the little knobs sticking off yes. that we put on the news and we call that the corona. That's what you mean? That's a spike yes, protein? Yes, that, that protein, the, the, which it uses to attach to human cells. You know, it, but it's just, to me, just a blessing that he was, this is a person at the NIH, he's very interested in, in how to make vaccines. That's been his life, his life study. He happened to be studying other viruses, not coronavirus, but closely related to other RNA viruses, ones that cause the common cold and things like that. And he said, oh, this should work for coronavirus. I mean, he just tells the story so incredibly interesting. So he called a few people and said, this is what I think you should do. They called him back and said, this works perfect. He called Jim Crow and said, okay, Jim, so this is how you've got the antibody. I've got the spike protein. Let's prove to them that it works and then we'll sell it to the pharmaceutical, sell it, we'll give the patent to the pharmaceutical companies, which they did, you know? Well, as long as they save the people world, I'm like, okay uh, with making some money, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, he's at the NIH, so he actually doesn't make money. Okay. <laughs> you can't sell a uh, government, because oh, you know okay. we've already paid right. for it. Great, yeah. All right. Just a comment about the spike protein, you know, people may or may not have heard of the spike protein, but as Dr. Drake is mentioning, you know, that's a really key protein. And, uh, you know, the name coronavirus is, a reference to, to the spike protein, the spike protein, which has those projections that go all around the virus, create a kind of crown around the virus particle. And it is in fact a protein. There are four proteins in this virus and one of them is the spike protein. Um, inside is RNA and outside is this protein coat. And the spike protein looks like a crown on the outside of the virus particle and Corona for those people who, maybe people know this, but corona means crown. And the reason that it's called coronavirus is because of this crown-like appearance of the virus due to these spikes or the spike protein all around the virus. That's why we call it coronavirus. How about that? There you go. <laughs> so um, we've got about five minutes left and I wanna get down to some, some just real common sense stuff. Um, if a person with sarcoidosis has been vaccinated, do they still need to wear a mask? And if they do, where should they wear it and where are they safe? I'll let you take that one. Um, yeah, thanks, Peter. So, you know, I, it's really tough. And I know people are tired of masking. I think uh, what people have to realize is half of the, half of the United States, half of Americans have gotten a vaccine, which means half have not. I mean, the numbers are just, approaching 50%. And, you know, what I say is it's never, it's better to be safe than sorry. So of course you wanna encourage your family members to get vaccinated. And then of course, uh, if you're all together, you know, the CDC has said, if it's a group of people who congregate frequently together and all have been vaccinated, you don't need to wear masks inside. So that makes sense. And they've also said that we're at the point where if you're outside and it's, it's more difficult to transmit, you don't have to wear a mask. But I think what they said, which I think makes a lot of sense, 
you're on a bus, you're on an airplane, you're in an area where there are other immune suppressed people that you should wear your mask. So hospitals, we're still masking. We're not gonna stop masking. Um, buses and planes, you know, where you're in a closed in area, you know, of course it makes sense to me. And this to me is outside of sarcoidosis. This is for everybody, you know, just to be safe. Right, uh, I agree. And, and so um, Dr. Sporn, the, the other sort of part of that question, is it safe to visit family? Can, can you go see your, your, uh, your grandchildren or if you're a grandchild, can you go see your grandparents? Is, if you've been vaccinated, is, is it now safe? And, and if sarcoidosis is a, is a wild card in that? Yeah, well, I think that people should um, use good judgment, but um, the, the frequency of infection is going down and hopefully people are vaccinated and that their family members are getting vaccinated. Now, small children obviously can't get vaccinated uh, because it's not, the vaccines are not approved for young children yet. Although as I think probably most everybody knows, a week or so ago, maybe over a little over a week ago, the Pfizer vaccine was approved for uh, down to age 12. And the Moderna vaccine is soon probably going to also be approved for uh, that age group. But they're also doing studies now in the younger children. So eventually even younger children will be able to get vaccinated. I think that it's safer now than it's ever been for vaccinated people to visit family members. Um, hopefully those family members are also vaccinated with the exception of the children. Um, and, um, you know, if there are family members who haven't been vaccinated, uh, you, you can probably be with them outdoors without a mask. Uh, you can be extra cautious if you're indoors and close, in close, close spaces with unvaccinated people, it's probably safer to wear a mask. As far as other common questions that sort of go along with this, as, such as, you know, travel, um, I think it's safer now to travel than it's been in the past. People mm -hmm. are concerned about getting on airplanes and whatnot. I think it's wise to wear a mask on, on the airplane. In fact, it's still really required to yeah, fly, to yeah. wear a mask. And so I agree with that uh, guideline. But if one does wear a mask on an airplane, uh, it's relatively safe. The air uh, exchange on an airplane actually is actually pretty good. So the risk of infection on an airplane, particularly if you're vaccinated, is, is pretty low. So I don't want to suggest that people can now be completely carefree and um, completely casual. I think people still need to be cautious, but uh, things are changing. And what we're saying now actually may change in another month or in another three months or six months. So. Uh, hopefully, the changes will be all in the direction that we want them to go in, which is that the risk of infection is going to be less and less with time. We can't be absolutely sure because there are always unknowns, uh, particularly with regards to the variants. But I think we're moving to a place where it's likely that as time goes on, uh, we'll be safer and safer if, if yeah. people are vaccinated. Yeah, and, and I just want to piggyback on that super quick. Um, I agree 110% with what Peter said. I think we do need to realize that there were some social and emotional consequences of everybody um, kind of hunkering down. <laughs> and this is the time, it's safe right now. So I wanna encourage people to spend time with your family. You know, we've seen more depression, more suicide, more abuse during this time because people were appropriately so for trying to kind of follow the guidelines. But right now they've been lifted our infection rates that we're seeing are the same as what they were at the end of February, beginning of March. So it didn't peak. It hasn't gotten down to the beginning of February, end of January, but, but it's definitely continuing to go down. So I wanna encourage people for healthy relationships to, to go out. You know, there've been people who never haven't left their yard that, you know, they ordered groceries in, they paid bills online. I mean, they have not physically left their property in months and haven't had meaningful contact with people, but we really do need to start back doing that for your emotional health. Right, and I don't and hear that, one of you saying that there's a separate, this is the advice you would give to anybody, not just somebody with sarcoidosis. I don't hear either of you 
saying, well, if you have sarcoidosis, it's different. Uh, what I hear you saying is sarcoidosis really, as far as we've been able to study, doesn't change the advice that the average everyday American is getting. Yeah, like it hasn't been studied, but we're not seeing outbreaks in sarcoid patients. So, so that's, that's really true. But I just would uh, mention, as I said earlier, again, I mentioned that um, if, if you have badly damaged lungs or if you have uh, uh, a heart problem uh, related to your sarcoidosis or related to something else, although sarcoidosis is what we're talking about today, then you know you may be at greater risk, so you have to be extra cautious under those circumstances. But um, I think hopefully we're moving to a time and a place where uh, we'll all be able to behave more normally in the future. We're not all the way there yet. Very good. Well, I think we are out of time. In fact, uh, Dr. Drake had to uh, step away just uh, quickly because we knew that she had another uh, event that she had to get to uh, right at the end of our time. So I didn't get a chance to thank her, but w obviously we do. And we really appreciate her insight from Vanderbilt University and Dr. Peter Sporn. Thank you very much for joining us as well. Okay, that's been a pleasure. Uh, and thank you to John and thank you, Dr. Sporn. Thank you to you guys. Uh, it was just an amazing session. Thank you so much. I'm sure we're going to get more questions <laughs> afterwards, uh, but uh, I feel much better about everything <laughs> having been to this. So thank you so much um, on behalf of FSR. Uh, we really appreciate you guys coming and, and doing this. So thank you. Sure. Thank Everybody's you. vaccinated. There you or go. will be That's soon. Right. Okay. Take care, everybody. And thank you. Bye-bye.